This month's podcasts are brought to you by Joel Peterson, Jam on Toast, Lynn Davis, Paul Newsham, Gil Hover, Lisa and James Jepson, Meeple Pete, Patrick Brophy, Mike Poole, Lorraine Compton and Ulf Pearson. Thank you so much for your support. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash 5G4D. Out of the street corners they scream. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for this for months. Rumour hardened into fear and now they scream at you. The sirens, their hysterical wail tearing through the white noise of the city. And you run. You run to pick up those things that can never be replaced. A picture of them in the days when they still loved you. Your mother's wedding ring. And then you turn to your shelf of games. You only have room for five. Five Games for Doomsday. Five Games for Doomsday is a show in which board game personalities are thrust into a cabin in the woods to outrun an oncoming disaster, but can only take five of their games with them. But which will they choose? My guest today is the most recognisable face of British game design. He's designed the world-renowned Snowdonia, as well as Guilds of London and the legendary Scandroon. He's the co-owner of Surprise Stare Games and publishes a daily blog on Board Game Geek, and I'm happy to say that I've spent time in his shed. Welcome, Tony Boydell. Well, hello, Mr Ben Maddox. And so, just to start, I usually ask everyone this to start off with. Was it difficult to pick the five games? Uh, not really, actually. Um, I do spend quite a lot of time thinking about games and gaming, so uh, I know what I like, and uh, it was pretty straightforward, to be honest. And are these? Were there any? Was there any particular criteria about picking the games? Was there any sort of I've got to be alone in this cabin, or I know these are games that I like, or there are memories attached to these games? Any sort of sentimental or practical reason for choosing them? Well, most of them are, have, have sentimental reasons attached to them, um, and we'll get to those, I guess, when we talk about them. But, um, yeah, I mean, all of them are games that I would um, never refuse a game of, basically. didn't matter whether it was the first one of the week or the 50th game of the week. I would never refuse. So let's start about you. How did you become a gamer? How do you get introduced to games? Well, I found copies of Dungeons and Dragons in a bookshop in Monmouth when I was uh, working as a Saturday boy at a, a local butcher's and I, I invested in a starter set. I think it cost me a fiver. And I was very intrigued by this. Um, I didn't do much with it though. It was just me and my brother and sister weren't interested in that kind of thing at all. So I just would just read them and look at the pictures and copy the dragons and that kind of thing. But um, later on, I... Um, sort of got together with a few pals and we started when I was working on my year out at college and we started role playing because one of the guys there Mark was uh, absolutely fantastic at refereeing and he was authoring his own uh, role playing system he was doing play by mail games um, running those systems and uh, yeah we, we, we loved it and we actually wanted to get together more often rather than just the Sunday so we started meeting on a, a Wednesday to play games like Risk uh, and then we discovered diplomacy and samurai swords, uh, and it all started building up from there. So, every, so many people use D and D as their introduction to these kind of things. Why didn't you? Use, why didn't you choose D and D as one of your five games? Because I played it with those guys, and I played it a little bit at college, but I've never played it since. So when was the last time you had a game of D&D &D, then? Oh, we're looking at... <laughs> this is show made. 1989, 1990, maybe. So we're talking 28 years, 27 years. And, and what, does, what do you think... D why do you think D&D &D is so enduring? And why do you think D&D &D has brought so many people? Why is it the gateway drug for gamers to such an extent? I think because it kind of presents you with the ability to be part of those books and films that you love so much it's sort of there in front of you and even if even if you don't play it very often which i didn't it was such a pleasure to read you're sort of getting a fantasy fix you're reading about the monsters or you're reading about the spells or you're reading about the equipment or the treasures it's all evocative it's it's almost it's it's a very disjointed sort of novel that you're reading with it but it, it has that sort of feeling um, I just used to love 
for instance, I got a copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide and I've still got it around here somewhere. It's very dusty. And I love the smell of it when it opened. And I just loved turning to a page and then reading level four spells and just going through them and just imagining what it would be like to do those. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it was sort of a gateway to something that I, I, re- I certainly really liked, but you couldn't get easily. I mean, you said you didn't play, you bought, you bought the starter set and you didn't play it. Did you have a sheltered childhood? Were there not other people apart from the family around to play with? Uh, not really. My family is quite small and insular, really. Um, and I went to um, a, gra- a boys' school in Monmouth, and I, I had to go home at the end of the day. I didn't stay in Monmouth, so um, I didn't really... My friends said we never got together, really, to to play because we couldn't stay after school because I'd have to get home. I, if I missed the bus, I was stuck. Plus, all the people, all the kids in my village, they all went to the Monmouth Comprehensive, so I, <laughs> they wouldn't be playing games with me. They'd be much rather kicking me up and down the middle of the bus because I was a, a, a grammar school boy. And was this, did you go to school during the secondary modern grammar school era? Well, I don't quite know what that one is, but I, I, I was 1979 to sort of 82 was my time when I, I went to that particular school. But it wasn't, you know, we didn't have social media, we didn't have easy access to movies. Um, so, you know, if, if you did love fantasy, you couldn't just Netflix your favourite fantasy movies. You couldn't even go to the video shop at first, you know. It was like sort of mid-80s before the, the video library phenomenon appeared. So, you know, things like Dungeons & Dragons that gave you that fantasy fix, you could do it at any time. And so what were some of the... So you said you played Risk and things. What were some of the other early games that you played? Um, well, Risk didn't last us very long because um, uh, a friend brought a copy of Samurai Swords along, which is, which is basically Risk, but it's got a bit more to it. Um, with the allocation of your your coins to to buy more resources or to hire the ninja or to to do whatever you buy start player um, and we really got into that because it just seemed a bit more to it than just sort of rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. You could actually have a little bit more of a plan and then with somebody brought along diplomacy and we 'd never heard of diplomacy um, and that was a real revelation to us because there was no dice in it at all. this was and this was proper thoughtful and um, you had to have a plan and you had to have a plan with, with other people and then you'd have to backstab them. And it became quite a hostile environment, as I think many people who've played Diplomacy will, will recall. And so let's move on then to you as a designer. Why did you transition from being a game player to a game designer? Well, it really came about when I started playing Magic the Gathering and I met a few other players of Magic, but um, one of them, Alan Paul, who I formed Surprise Stare Games with, he had designed games in the 1980s um, and had a little foray himself with sort of self-publishing. And when we weren't talking about Magic the Gathering, I was really interested in what this game design thing was all about. And I'd been doing a cartoon strip in my spare time for five or six years called The Black Overcoat. And I'd been noodling about with the idea of doing a board game to sort of recreate this cartoon character so you could sort of live these cartoons in a storytelling type way. And I I made a really clumsy sort of action pointy system with lots of tiny chits and a huge uh, fold out board that covered an entire table. And I played Magic the Gathering and it began to change the way I thought about doing this black overcoat game to do it in the style of Magic the Gathering, to have cards, card drawing Um, hand management, special effects, objects, all sorts of stuff like that. And as I was developing that and playing Magic, I started seeing other games, certainly that Alan was playing and Alan was talking about, and a a mutual friend of ours, Mark, as well. And that became something that attracted my attention. It sort of diverted me. And after I'd converted the Black Overcoat game into sort of a Magic-like card-driven storytelling game um very quick succession the prototype designs for copper twaddle and a game called ecology were were in my notebook um ecology was a game where about the world is covered in pollution you have to clear away the pollution then put animals back into their habitats that design actually was the basis of what would become over the engine okay so moving on to your first game your first game is an absolute behemoth in the world of board games but it has 
two reputations. One is that it's an incredible game, and another is that it's a very punishing, very insular kind of game, and the people who are real freaks at the game can be a little, I don't know, overbearing with it. And this is Agricola. So why do you think Agricola has this sort of Janus-like two reputations? Well, I think... um in terms of it being one of the best games ever designed, I think it, it is a wonderful combination of that worker placement mechanic uh, taken sort of to the next level from what it had originally been with, with uh, Richard Breeze's uh, key game to something that was sort of revelatory. It's like, oh, wow, I can put my worker here and do this, and then that gives me that, and I can combine these things together, and then I can do another action, I can do something else, I can, I can, I can kind of grow, I can see this farm being built in front of me. But then what it gives with the worker placement, it then punishes you with with the need for the feeding. And I certainly found when I started playing it that I was there's a confidence that you kind of have to build when you play Agricola um, because the, the food feeding is seems so terribly cataclysmic in terms of how it destroys your points and how it ruins your game. But for the first few games, I would be terrified of actually growing my family. But of course... Getting more actions in a game means you get to do more things, which includes establishing a food engine, getting better resources, all that kind of stuff, and doing more and scoring more points. And I, I certainly found it a, a, a wonderful sort of revelation in my own thoughts about gaming, about taking it to the next level. It's not simply put something there, take it, and that's three points. Put something else over there, take that, it's worth two points. There's more going on there's more interaction between your actions and other players actions as well and i think because of the punishing aspect a lot of people would say i mean my wife said to me why why would i want to play agricola it's hard enough in real life why would i want to spend two hours through a punishing building of a farm in medieval times you know i get enough trial and tribulation in my real life i don't need to be playing a game that recreates that same kind of experience but i think once you've pushed through that barrier, once you've got through that sort of sword over your head that's a, that is feeding the family, the whole game flowers and blossoms into this wonderful variety of, of, of combinations and possibilities, all the different cards. I mean, this is a game that came in a, in a standard size Euro box, but it had over 300 different cards, 150 occupations to help you build your farm, 150 minor improvements, things to deck out your farm. And the combination, some were terrible, some were brilliant, some were ridiculously overpowered, some were pretty good and, and sort of staple cards. And I loved that, that discovery process. And 10 years later, um, 11 years now, I'm still discovering that delight. I still feel that same way about it. People who really get into Agricola, if you play it a lot, and again, another great quote from my wife is, Again, why would I play this with you? You've played it so many times that I haven't got a chance of winning. And I guess there's that perception that my experience of the game now is so rich that it does feel like I'm on a different level and that people don't just, just don't want to have to go through what they perceive is a pointless task. Why play against Tony? He's, he's going to win. I mean, it's not necessarily true, but, um, you know, it's that kind of perception. Is it, it's, you've, you've become almost unattainable in that um, in that level really there's the reputation of euro gamers they're, they're sometimes portrayed as snobby elitist people who s look down their noses at games that are open to the varied prevarications of chance is this portrayal of people correct or do you think it's a gross misrepresentation um well i think it is true um but i think that's that's nothing particularly gamery about it i think we're all sniffy about about things that, that we don't particularly like or can't understand why other people like i mean you just have to look at the reviews of last jedi to to see that um that people have vastly different opinions about that um there are games that I absolutely adore and there are games I, 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 I wouldn't give the time of day and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't use the components to wipe my bottom with. Uh, but that's just me and uh, it depends. It depends what mood I'm in. If, I, if I'm pressed to play a game I really don't like, then I will probably get quite sniffy and hoity-toity about it. 
So moving on then, surprise stare. Why start your own publishing company? Alan had uh, had had games published in the past, and we'd been playing quite a lot of my copper twaddle prototype. And we thought this is this would be quite fun to turn to turn into a a proper published um, item. I mean, I didn't really know myself who on earth to approach, so I, you know, I didn't know that there were any companies I could go to and pitch these ideas at. I didn't even know that um, Essence Spiel existed at all at, at the time that I was working on Copper Twaddle. Um, I had, in the past, with my Black Overcoat game, been working with Gibson Games to try and turn it into something that they might have been interested in. A chap called Roger Hayworth, who was very instrumental at Gibson Games, um, in, in sort of introducing them to those more European-style board games that they did um, he was very helpful, but I, I didn't really know where to go. So Alan and I had both become IT contractors. We were quite flush with cash compared to the, the cash that we'd had when we were permanent employees. So we thought, well, it's only a pack of cards. It, how difficult can it be? And um, and uh, that's how we started. So Copper Toddle was our first. And how did it do? It did far worse than we expected to, <laughs> it, uh, because... Um, we were told about Essen Spiel and we went there and we were expecting, oh, you know, 150,000 people. We've only got a thousand copies of this game. It'll be a breeze to sell this game. It'll be absolutely fine. It'll all go and we'll be home by the Friday. But of course, it, it doesn't work that way. And it, it didn't then. And there were only a third of the games released that there are now. Um, but it was a valuable experience. Uh, we have sold them all now eventually. But um yeah, it, I think we sold, mind you, I, I think we sold 400, I think, out of the 1,000, which I think probably for a brand new company is a, is a rip-roaring success. But we, we didn't know that then. We had no experience. And, and how was, uh, have you ever been to Essen as a punter? Have you always gone as a company? Always gone as a, as a company. And do you feel, would you like to go as a punter and just bum around for four days and play games and do nothing else? No. Uh, not really. It's an awfully expensive way to spend four days playing games when I can play them at home. Um, I like the backstage pass element of, of, of a show like Essen Spiel as well. The fact you get in early, you leave late, you get to see things that other people don't see. And I don't mean that in a menacing sort of way. But, you know, there's a sort of feeling of there's a sort of special feeling about it, about being privy to all of that. And it makes the gaming world even more exciting and wonderful for me because I get to see those behind the scene workings. So what was Surprise Stairs first taste of success then? I think uh, it should have been uh, Alan's first game published with us called Confucius. It was uh, we had a terrible experience with a co-publisher um and it ended up breaking even for us rather than being a a big success. I mean when it was launched we were on the same stand as Martin Wallace so we had all those people that um coming along as well we were getting a sort of echoes of, of trade from those people because confucius is a is a good martin wallacey type euro game uh, but our real success came a year later really after the sort of sourness of, of what could have been with confucius even though it sold well for us was fuzzed and what was the issue with the co-publisher uh, it was all to do with finances and us paying money and then not, not paying it to the printers and and we ended up having to raise a rather lot of money rather quickly. Otherwise, we'd never have seen a single copy of the game. And that was um, terrifying for us. It nearly, it nearly broke the company. And uh, it nearly broke Alan as well, actually. It was a tremendously stressful time for him. But then Fuzzed was your first real success. Yeah, it sort of... We, we decided to go back to doing things ourselves. We didn't want to collaborate with anybody else. We thought, no, we'll go back to what we did right at the start, which is I did the, the artwork, Charlie did all the art colouring in and laying out of the actual sort of template. Alan would organise the production and we would market it ourselves. And we did a 1,500 copies of Fuzzed. Uh, we took it to UK Games Expo. We sold 250 copies, which is huge for the Expo at that time because it was still based in its little venue in the middle of the Hagley Road. Um, and then we took it to Spiel and we... It, it sold out. I mean, we didn't have a single copy to bring back with us. And, I, and it was the first time we'd sold out. We also got a, a approached by a couple of companies to license it. Um, and we eventually went with Griffin Games. So that was the first game that we had that had been licensed by anybody as well. And um, 
It was absolutely fantastic. Such a recovery from our experiences from the previous couple of years. And to, to top it all, Ma um, Martin Wallace had a few copies of his games left. Uh, last train to Wensleydale and a couple of the others that came out that year from Tree Frog. And he needed them back, getting back to the UK. And I had an empty van. So we loaded up my van with his games and I drove them back to the UK for him. So that was that was our first year where we sort of sort of felt like we'd actually achieved something. It was a real step up for us. Of course, a couple of years later, we would have we we would have our experience with Snowdonia and and that that really changed everything for us. So, your second game is a mass market game. And a lot of gamers might turn up their nose at this game. Probably I would, too, to some degree, but I've never played it, so I can't really say much about it. But it's beyond Balderdash. Why beyond Balderdash? Uh, because I have had some of the funniest experiences playing this game that I've ever had in my life. I've laughed so hard that I, I can't breathe. I've seen other people go so red in the face, uh, we actually feared that they were having a cardiac arrest. Beyond Balderdash is give us a it's not give us a call my bluff it's call my bluff. Um, For those who aren't British, you get a word and you get three definitions. Three definitions, one of them being the correct one, and you have to guess what the the real definition is. Absolutely, and in Beyond Balderdash, you have that you have a word. So there's a there's a true word definition, and everybody else has to make up their own definitions, trying to basically make everybody believe that your definition is the correct one. And this started. I was introduced to this by my wife's family at one of their Christmases, and very quickly I found um, a competition, a feud developing between my wife's aunt Sarah and myself, and um, it became one of those ones where every time we played it. It was who could make the other one guess their definitions the most. It was absolutely wonderful. And again, it, it's so much laughter. We, 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 my wife's family are very smart people, and so the definitions were devious and, and, and hypnotic and, and duped all the time. It was absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And we've been playing this as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of three or four times a year game with the Ross and Y board gamers. Uh, and Ben and Becky and, and Jobbers and, and all the others that come along to it, if they happen to happen along, we all have a wonderful time. We're, again, it's a lot of people who are all on the same sort of wavelength, and it's it's hilarious, absolutely hilarious. And, and do you think gamers are too snobby about mass market games, or are mass market games mostly awful? Well, this is a hard thing to sort of quantify now, because actually Codenames is mass market, Quirkle is mass market, Azul is is surely going to be mass market. These are crossover games. You could argue that Carcassonne is now mass market. Settlers of Catan certainly is. Um, I think if they're being snobby about mass market games, I think they're not realising that actually quite a lot of what they've got in their collection should really be that way. Um, the game world has changed, hasn't it, in the last 10 years? And I think... Um, the crossover is getting more and more because people are actually coming over towards us rather than us having to sort of go back to their level, if you like, this old perceived level of the, of the Cluedos and Monopolies and the roll and move. People are actually coming towards our style of game. And I say that in a sort of slightly elitist, it belongs to me type of way. So you have your success with first which is a terribly a terrible word to say on a podcast because you get plosive peas everywhere. You have your success with Fust, and then is the next game you publish Snowdonia? No, we did um, Totemo, which is a three D sort of building game with colours and numbers. That was uh, that was one of mine, and then we did Paperclip Railways, and we also published Sebastian Bleasdale's On the Cards, which is a tremendous sort of mutating traditional card game game um so we kind of bimbled along with those we were we were quite happy the money from one game helped us produce the next one um and then snowdonia had been been bimbling along in the background for a long time and i finally sort of re-engineered a, a second prototype that was pretty much what you can see now in snowdonia uh, and the story of that is is well known in the sense that i I sent a, a speculative email to, to Lookout Games, 
of whom I was a massive, and still am a massive fanboy, um, thinking, well, it's a bit like Agricola. It's a, you know, th- they might like this if it's that same kind of game. And um, the email came back saying, well, yeah, I actually like Snowdonia, the place. Mount Snowdon is wonderful. I go there a lot. Of course, I'd be interested in seeing your game. Um, and that was it. The game got sent off. And then emails started coming back saying, well, this is good. I like this. I don't like this. Which is the most feedback I'd ever gotten from anybody. Normally, you'd wait six months and then, a, then a, the box would come back with a letter that said, it's not really for us. Thanks. Good luck. Bye. But Hanno was very communicative. He was very positive. He was very helpful and encouraging. And it became very clear quite quickly that that it was going to be coming out with Lookout Games. And that was that was quite something. And how did that how did that yeah, how did that feel? Because, you know, you've got this publisher that is one of the most renowned publishers in the world. How does it feel to be accepted by something like that? How much of an endorsement of your skill is that? I was absolutely delighted and honoured. And I also felt a, a, a sense of it's sort of achievement in the sense that I've worked for this. As Surprise Day Games, we put in a lot of time and effort with all of the games that we produced up to that point. And there is, you can see there's, a, there's, a, there's an evolution there there's, in terms of our presentation, in terms of our, the quality of the games. They're getting better and more interesting and we're thinking about them more. And Snowdonia was the kind of the pinnacle, our reward for, for sticking with it for 10 years. Because so many companies, we'd we'd been going to Essen for sort of eight of those 10 years. And you'd be next to other little companies. There was a company from America called Eight Foot Llama. You know, they stopped coming to Essen after a couple of years. And you'd see booths rise and fall and people would disappear. And we'd we'd been there. We'd we'd survived 10 years of this. And finally, finally, we'd, we'd got it right. It was a wonderful feeling. Absolutely wonderful. Very exciting. So let's go back to the origin. How did you come up with the idea for Snowdonia? And was this was this train thing an obsession that you had previously, or did Snowdonia inculcate you with the obsession with trains? Snowdonia uh, was the the mother of my my obsession with trains. Um, we started with a conversation about train games. I think it was Essen, two thousand and five. And this is when Age of Steam was absolutely huge and there were railway dice and lots of other railway games coming out. And um, they were the thing. Everybody adored them. And somebody said, well, what would you do as a railway game? And just to sort of be contrary, I said, well, I wouldn't have a network building game. I would have just one railway because no one's done a game about digging away, laying the track, making the track at the foundry. No one would have done a game like that before. And I'd love to do a game like that. And when you say things like that at Essen Spiel, they lodge in the back of your mind. And I started making notes and I started putting bits and pieces together. Um, and it kind of went on from there. But once Snowdonia was out in 2012, I immediately began thinking about other railways that could be used in the game. And as I looked around and I researched local railways and more famous railways in the UK and abroad, I just began feeling so hypnotized by the whole thing i found it absolutely fascinating there's a great element of nostalgia as well I, you know maybe i was hitting a midlife crisis at the time as well but looking at old photographs especially of my local railway station in Newham, and thinking you know we don't have that there's nothing there now it's just a dirty hole in the ground but five years before i was born there was there was an entire railway station there were trains coming and going 15 20 times a day you know, there's a there's a sort of nostalgic feeling of loss almost as well with these things. They're so romantic. The stories are so wonderful. So do you think with the, I mean, essential governmental push towards cars and the closing down of the railway stations in the 50s in Britain, I remember I came from a little town, uh, even smaller than where you're from with, you know, 2,000 people at that time. And we had a local train station in the 50s and up to the 60s when they were all closed down. Do you lament the loss of train travel? And is train travel still romantic? I do lament uh, the the, the sort of scale of the network. I mean, I do quite a lot of train travelling um, nowadays. I'm not quite so much at the moment, but uh, when I was working in London, I was in and out on the trains all the time. Um, 
and I do love a train journey. Uh, but um, I do lament that idea that if you wanted to go into Gloucester, for instance, which is the nearest city to to my town, that you know you can get in the car now and go any time you like. But at, fifty years ago, you couldn't do that. You'd have to get on the train, and it'd take you time to get in there. You'd probably dress up nicely because you wouldn't have done it very often. You know, this is a special thing. It'd be, it would have become a, a day trip, an excursion. Um, and I kind of miss that. I think we take so much for granted now. Um, this is an old man waxing lyrical now. All I need is a, a porch and a jug of cider and a rocking chair. But yeah, I, I do, I do, do miss it. Do you think your designs are British? Do they have a British identity? Or is this just me creating something out of my mind? <laughs> I think they do. I think I think there's a there's a there's a, a dark humour uh, to to my games. There's a there's a quirkiness. Um, the British have a have a great history, industry, and sort of proper history. And if you think like kings and things, um, so there's such a rich environment that you grow up in. I mean, I grew up in the countryside and there were, you know, three castles within a small bike ride from my house. So you're surrounded and steeped in this, this sort of heritage wherever you looked. And I think there's quite a lot of affection that, that leaches into my designs because I, I don't design games about things I don't like. I design games about things that I am interested in or I find fascinating or are just sort of romantically pleasing to me. So... What do you think the future is for board games in Britain? I'm hoping it'll be more of them. Um, British, I mean, for the British sort of society, board gaming is still a, a niche thing. Um, it's not the main thing. TV, social media, that's the main thing. We are still a, a small part of, of, of a bigger hobby world. But I, I, I hope that um, shows like UK Games Expo will are helping to expose more people to these you know, to these mass market games, the games like Codenames and Quirkle and, and Carcassonne and Settlers and, and moving them into more wonderful things that await them. Do you think there's a problem with atomization and people feeling like they don't reach out and actually have real world connection to other people? And do you think this might be a reason why board games are becoming popular again? Well, it is frustrating to be sat in a room full of people in your family and all of them are looking at their phones and no one is is sort of making eye contact with you. And I think, um, you know, when we do get together as a family and watch something on the TV or we play a board game, it is everybody sort of looks at each other with a sort of wide eyed excitement. Like, why don't we do this more often? And then it all plunges back into lolling about with a glass of wine, watching something on the TV or scrolling through the never-ending infinity of Facebook posts. Um, I, think, I think it's growing because it's, board gaming is a colourful world, it's a social world, and it's, it's a face-to-face -face social world. So, your next game is one I've, lit I've heard mentioned, but I've no idea about. And this is Princess of Florence, and this is a Vulcan Karma game. Why is this on your list? Because it is the perfect board game. It is... Uh, an incredible design, uh, a number of elements that fit together seamlessly. Uh, it plays beautifully in, in our particular group. We've never had a bad game of this game at all. It's very simple. You have a hand of profession cards. These allow you to combine various elements to perform works, which get you money. And then when you get your money from performing a work, from building a work, you decide whether you want to take it as all money all victory points or a little bit of both um, and the game proceeds for seven rounds the problem is that the works cost progressively more in terms of the threshold they have to cross in order to, to happen in the first place so you have to buy the right things in the auction at the start of the round then you have to use your two actions in the round um, very wisely to get the maximum out of what you're doing. This is a game that lasts seven rounds. You have two actions per round, and you have one thing each round to buy in an auction. Fourteen actions. You buy seven things in an auction. I mean, that's a ridiculously small number of things. It's a ridiculously tight space in which to work, and yet it is so rich. The strategies, the 
the, the group think, the, the playfulness of the auctions, it's absolutely wonderful. When everybody knows the game, when everybody's got an idea of what they're doing, it is elbows all around the table, people getting in each other's face. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a superbly well-oiled machine. Wonderful game, wonderful. Why do you think it's been forgotten, largely? I'm not sure that it has. I think it's it's quietly there all the time. I mean, Wolfgang is... I mean, as if Princes of Florence wasn't enough, he also designed El Grande, the best area area control, area majority game that there is. El Grande is superb. Six Nint. Who doesn't finish their evenings with a game of Six Nint? It's, it's, it's just wonderful. I think Princes of Florence is still getting lots of attention. It's just not shouted about. We use it in the Ross and Y Club as a real grounding game it's a comfort blanket of a game if the world is getting a bit too noisy for us we just sit down and we play princess of florence and it just sets everything to right it's 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 wonderful and if i were to sit at the table with you for a game of princess of florence would i be mercilessly destroyed probably I think I think we there are a couple of basic rules to follow with princess of florence bits of advice that are very wise um, but I think it wouldn't hurt you to play the game once and see what happens and not worry too much about the result. Because once you've seen the way that it works, because it isn't a complicated game, uh, it's, it is the players that make the game good or bad. If people don't understand auctions and they sit around and they, they make stupidly wild bids, everything goes for too low or everything goes for too high then it, you're going to get an awful experience. But it, it settles into this, this, this perfection. But that's, I think maybe new players won't consider Princes of Florence because it's a game that requires that sort of playtime, that, that, that sort of commitment to playing. If, you, you, you know, if they play it once and they have a terrible experience, they'll never play it again. And yet they're missing out on brilliance. And I had this experience personally with Agricola. I nearly gave the game up after the first five games that I played because I was doing terribly. I could never get to my third person. I was too frightened. Um, but I stuck with it and things began to click. It's, um, I, yeah, you would get crucified. <laughs> so you're not just a publisher. You're not just a designer. You're also a media creator. So you have a blog called Every Man Needs a Shed, which is a daily blog, which is an incredible undertaking. So firstly, why is it called Every Man Needs a Shed? Well, it's, uh, this is one of my quirky British things, really. Uh, my my favourite band of all time is XTC, and they have a, one of their songs on their more recent albums where one of the lyrics is, Every Man Needs a Shed. Um, and I thought, well, yeah, absolutely. I have a shed in my garden. I used to do my working from home in there but now it's completely full of all my game design stuff all my prototypes all my paper and my paper clips and my meeples and my cubes um it's a safe space it's also a curiously british thing for a man to go into his shed whether he keeps his pigeons in there or his gardening tools or his whippets or his pornographic magazines whatever it is a british man needs to have a shed so when did you start the blog it was around March of 2011, so this was before the world changed for me in gaming with, with Snowdonia. It was, I can't really remember why I started. I did one of those usual, hello, my name's Tony and this is what I do, sort of opening posts. And I decided that, because I used to keep a diary quite a lot when my children were very, very tiny, I thought, I'd, well, if I keep it daily, that'll keep it going. Because the last thing I wanted to do was to do what everybody else did with blogs, which is sort of say, hello, I'm Tony, and then you'd never hear from them again. I'd also written quite a lot of articles for Star City Games in the in the US when I was a Magic player. They used to have lots of strategy articles and, and reviews of new sets, of Magic sets and so on, expansions. And I used to provide all the jokes. I used to do these stupid articles where I would just mess about, take the piss out of the game, relentlessly ridicule its players, its experts, its, its, its entire fabric. And they quite liked that. They quite liked that sort of quirky British humour. So I was able to recycle a few of those to keep those articles and turn them into board gaming articles to sort of keep myself going when I was first doing the Shed blog. 
Um, and when I got into a rhythm, when it became what I did, go out, play games in the evening, come home, write up the blog, go to sleep. You know, it became a rhythmic thing. It became a sort of sort of like meditation for me, really. It was a way of bringing myself down from from the, the events of the day. And uh, it, as it goes on, it becomes quite addictive. And so how popular is it? Do you know how many people read it? No, not really. Somebody suggested once that I ought to um, put some kind of filtering thing on it, something that would sort of send people via some county site somewhere. But um, I, I quite like not knowing, really. It's quite nice when people comment that I've never seen pop up before. Um, you know, you look at the, the little thumb count in the corner and you think, oh, God, I've only had 15 thumbs today. You know, perhaps I shouldn't have said that rude word. Um, it's not quite the same now, but um, it's it's quite nice to have the mystery, really. I mean, you you... How do I put this? You swear a lot, and you you especially are especially fond of the the word that a lot of people consider over the line. Do you think there's an element of puritanism within board gamers? I think the answer is probably the same as uh, as the one I gave earlier about sort of sort of people do people look down their noses at certain types of games. I think not particularly in gamers. I think. People have have become quite ingrained at, at what's taboo and what isn't. I find myself more and more feeling sort of righteously rageful about the world and what's happening in it, and people's preoccupations with whether a particular word is very, very rude or not. It's it's so ridiculous, uh, especially when it's a word that's been co-opted by by Puritans. To you know, they decided that was a rude word. You know, we could have had cabbage as being the rudest word or as Douglas Adams coined Belgium, of course. Um, it's so ridiculous that, that a single word is treated so outrageously. It's a word and it's, it has a meaning and it has a true and proper meaning and we shouldn't stop being so bloody prissy about it. Uh, in fact, if, if... And it seems to me that people remove all context the word itself is intrinsically bad which makes no sense to me it's it's what it is i refuse to be cowed by it um i am trying i mean i it depends on my mood my blog if it gets particularly sweary i'm probably not having a very good time either at work or at home or both um it is like a diary so there are elements of my blog sometimes that are perhaps more revealing than you might think um, there's a bit more of me that goes into it than you might first see. So, what are some of the highlights of your blog, if people would like to check it out? Um, well, I quite like my write-ups of the Friday nights at the Ross and Y Gamers, because Ben Bateson, the, the club founder um, and backbone of the club, he writes his version of events on the Ross and Y Gamers blog, and it's often quite funny to see how our two views of the same evening can differ quite radically. Um, that, that that always amuses me. Um, I like it when I, I I like some of the ridiculous game shop sketches that I do. Um, often they come from the, this sort of tradition. I mean, I love British comedy. Being a Brit, I, there's a lot of British comedy I absolutely adore. So I love doing little homages to some of my favourite sketches. For instance, I love the humorous ones because they are. They, they're me delighting in 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 my sense of humour, things that I find particularly hilarious or or ridiculous. I love lampooning those. I also like um, being a bit more upfront, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. It's sometimes I'll be quite frank about things. Sort of, I've had a, lost a couple of friends over the last few years, and I feel very emotional about it, and I feel very strongly about it, and I and I don't mind sharing that information, you know. And I think a lot of people. Can like it when they can see a bit more of me. I mean, I'm not just about the swearing. I'm not just about the knob jokes. There is somebody else there. There's a game designer. So I do my game design sort of sneak previews. There's a human being behind it. So your next game is probably the hipster's choice. And it's partly a hipster's choice because no one can get hold of it. But it's glory to Rome. Why does everyone love this game so much? Because it's absolutely fantastic. 
it's such a straightforward mechanical idea. I mean, it, the, the rule book that I originally saw when I first played it was absolutely horrendous, trying to dis- define the various places that a card can be taken from or end up. But at its heart, it's your it's the perfect multifunction use, the multi-use card card game. A card is an action, or it's a bonus action if it's a client, or it's a victory point value, or it's something that increases your your capacity to do things, or it's a resource for building, or it's a building in itself. The effects are explosively ridiculous, um, massively overpowered, but then they're all like that. So every player can have their moment of triggering something absolutely profane in terms of game effects. It looked awful in its presentation, but it, it makes a mockery of that with the, with the sheer perfection of the design itself. It is without peer. And so do, does any of his reiterations, do any of them come close, Matinei? Uchronia. Matina is fantastic. Um, I really like innovation, but only with three players. Um, Uchronia, I bought it and I played it and I thought, well, why am I going to bother playing this when I can play Glory to Rome? Why would I want to play something that was the same but felt a little bit easier or less interactive? I just... I always came back to Glory to Rome and I played it at my birthday party last year with uh, three other people who knew how to play the game. I didn't have to teach anybody. and We just dealt everything and we just got going and it was wonderful. We all had a fantastic time because I think for everybody at the table at the time, this was the first time in a long time we didn't have to teach and it just became about the game and about our strategies and how we were going to adapt to what each other was doing and what was happening in the middle of the table with the with the pool, which is such a wonderful mechanic of cards ebbing and flowing in their availability. Uh, It's it's superb. So you're an industry person. Have you any idea why this game isn't being republished? Well, I have suspicions. I have actually tried on at least three occasions. I have communicated with the Cambridge Games factory folks and said, I would like to get the licence to produce another version of this. Um... But every time I'm turned away, um, and I'm, I think there's an acrimony within the company and with, between the company and the designer. I think the designer is certainly not interested in, in, in raking up any of this again, um, which is a, a, an enormous shame because it is, it's such a wonderful thing and so many people just cannot experience it. It is such a, such a rare thing to find. I mean, I've had at least five copies of it in my possession. I've still got two. I've given away copies to my f- sort of to new friends because they've, you know, they've, they've wanted to get a copy and they couldn't get it. Um, but it goes for stupid money now. And it's such a, such a damn shame. What's your future? As a game designer, what are you working on? What have you got coming out? And what about Surprise Stare Games? What's the future for the company? Well, for Surprise Stare, it's it's kind of more of the same of what we've been doing over the last few years. We've um, with Cousins War, which is a fantastic discovery and a fantastic piece of work between David Mortimer, the designer, and and Alan Hall of 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 Surprise Stare. Um, That's being pushed through to a second edition with multiple languages. That's been a tremendous success for us. And I, I'd love to do more of that kind of thing. I'd love us to, to give a little bit back, really, to help out and to do a bit of scouting. And uh, uh, We never got any attention, really, from, from other, other companies apart from Lookout Games when they took on Snowdonia. So um, I would love to do a bit of that. We've, I've got a nice cup of tea coming out with Matago which is sort of based on Snowdonia, but introduces sort of an extra layer to it. Um, There's lots of prototypes lying around the place, Um, more expansion ideas for Snowdonia. We're working on a third edition of Snowdonia at the moment, looking to get that kick-started, and there's some quite exciting things going on with that. So it's more of the same, and it's more of the same in an environment where we don't really have to worry about money because we know our capabilities we know not to stretch ourselves we've learned our lessons um we know how we we want things to look we know we want the right kinds of quality we know what people expect nowadays 
you can't pass things off in a cheap and nasty way. You've got to think about all these things very carefully. Um, yeah, more of the same. It's, it's, it's great. And so why are you taking Snowdonia to Kickstarter? Because this will be your first Kickstarter game. Well, we have some money, but we don't have enough money to sort of commit to a 3,000, 4,000 print run. Um, so Kickstarter just seems like a, a, a sensible pre-selling environment. Um, we're always getting asked, not just by, by players, but also by other companies about, you know, when are we doing another version? You know, are there going to be other language versions? It's still going strong after five years. Um, Kickstarter for us is, is sort of a, 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 it's a fundraising it's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to help us raise the funds to be able to produce the game because we can't produce it ourselves um, on our own. So your final game is probably, well, it's definitely the most personal game on your list. And and this is a Tony Boy Dell game that probably, I don't know, maybe less than 100 people have played. And I'm I'm privileged to be one of them this is the black overcoat game explain it for the people listening well this uh, i mentioned it earlier on but it's basically um a game designed around a character cartoon character i was doing called the black overcoat and in one of the cartoon stories i did he went to his family home and he met up with all his relatives and surprisingly enough all his relatives looked almost exactly like he did except they had different hairstyles or different clothes and it was a murder by death comedy sort of inheritance story so all the characters were, were, were killing each other off or being murdered by somebody unseen until the last surviving member of the family was going to inherit the wealth of their deceased uncle Hesketh. Um and this game started off a very fiddly very complicated hundreds and hundreds of tiny little chits it became a card driven game with lots of similarities to, to trading card games. As I mentioned, Magic the Gathering was responsible for sort of turning it into that. And it's all handcrafted. There is only one copy of this game. I would print out um, a sort of a template for the cards. I would then run it through a photocopier at work. And then I would use a work laminator. Uh, the, work, <laughs> the work did a lot of stuff for me. Um, to laminate the cards and I would cut them out and then stack them up in the decks and I would draw extra cards at training courses or sitting at home watching the TV I would have ideas for extra stuff um, and it's all about running around the house uh, sort of this house is a very labyrinthine building collecting objects finding members of the family lurking in corners strange events happen the ultimate aim is to find three pieces of the map this gives you access to a selected room card chosen at random and that gives you one turn head start on all the other players and you've got to get to that room before the other players do in order to win the game but if you don't manage it you then have to reveal the card at the beginning of your next turn and then everybody knows where the family treasure is and then it's a it's a real knife fight in the telephone box to get to get there it's ridiculous turns can take a long time they can take no time at all as a sort of fluxy element to to the way the game shapes and changes but for us it's always been about the stories that come out of it sort of we had a game where we had the uncle's 75th birthday party and we all basically moved around the table and woke up as somebody else we you would find double bases hanging from chandeliers you'd find members of the family hiding in wood piles in the cellar the ridiculous comedy storytelling of it is something that's kept us all howling with laughter for many years. And so have you just basically played this with your family and watched your children grow up playing this game? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, they're, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the cards has a picture of a baby being passed from one person to the next, and that's my eldest daughter. Because when we would play this in my dining room... Um, when it was not your turn, she was like the start player marker. She would be passed to the next player and then it would be your turn. And so this baby Alice would go around the table and that would, you would know whose turn it was. It was the person to the, the right of the person holding Alice. So right from that time, right up to we play it now, when, when our children come home from their travels around the world or wherever they are, we'll get a bottle of wine out and we'll play the Black Overcoat game. I was just going to say, I was really surprised when I was staying at your place how eager everyone was in the family to play the Black Overcoat game. 
Yes, because it's it's a, a, it's it's a sharing thing. They they know the cartoon character, if not the cartoon, because some of it's a bit ripe, and I never showed it to them, but they've never asked. But for them, it's always been about the the experience of playing it. You know, somebody finding a bomb and blowing up, and they they just love that that element to it. Um, there's a sentimental thing to it as well because a few of the cards uh, were hand drawn the images were drawn by a great friend of ours who died five years ago so whenever we see those cards it reminds us of this this chat and um, it just makes us smile it's a shared experience because he used to play it a lot with us as well so it's it's a shared personal experience it's intimate for our family you know it's not something i could i feel i would be happy to share with with anybody else it's it's a personal thing so are you happy that it never got published and it remains this private family thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think it's um, it's one of those things I look at the box and it just makes me smile. I re- it just brings back so many memories of the children when they were younger or our friends or our guests who played it with us. It's, um, it's too personal to sort of open it out to everybody else and certainly too personal to open it to to reviews and geek ratings and all that kind of stuff. I don't want anybody spoiling that. So you've got one last question. You're driving up to the cabin and you skid around a corner and the back seat of the car flies open. Four of the games fly out of the car and smash into the ravine, but one game is left on the back seat. Which game do you hope it is? I think because of what it means to me is it's going to have to be the black overcoat game. That's my life. That's my life in a box. So if people want to contact you or see what you're up to, how can they do that? Well, I'm on board game geek. Uh, I do my daily blog. Every man is a shed. You can message me on geek mail just by clicking on that handy little envelope. Um, yeah. Surprise stair games has a website. If you're interested in any of the games that we might have left in stock, it's www.surprisestairgames. Dot co dot uk. Tony Boydell, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. And if you want to suggest a guest, or if you want to say something nice about the show, or if you want to say something horrible about the show, then you can contact me on at 5 Games for Doomsday on Twitter, or you can send me an email at 5 Games for Doomsday at gmail.com. You can visit the website 5 Games for Doomsday.com, or you can go to the BGG Guild. You can also support the show to get patron exclusive thoughts from the cabin and shows from conventions by going to patreon.com forward slash 5g 4d and if i haven't had to power boats to my lakeside survival nook to escape the sentient rubber plants and the cats with guns i'll see you in two weeks for more five games for doomsday doomsday